Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Thomas Sowell has taught and studied economics, intellectual history, and social policy at institutions that include Cornell, UCLA, and Amherst. Now a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution, Dr. Sowell has published more than a dozen books, including his most recent volume, a revised and enlarged edition of Discrimination and Disparities. Tom Sowell, welcome. Thank you. Let me quote Discrimination and Disparities. This edition, this new edition, takes on the non sequitur underlying the prevailing social vision of our time, namely that if individual economic benefits are not due solely to individual merit, there is justification for having politicians redistribute those benefits." Close quote. Now, Tom, we want to be a country based on individual merit. So if some people are rich through no merit of theirs, and other people are poor through no fault of theirs, isn't it clear that the government ought to play Robin Hood and take from the rich and give to the poor? Why is that a non sequitur <laughs> instead of an obvious good? Oh my gosh. I don't know where to begin. Uh, Take your time. <laughs> what? I, I, you can imagine now, I'll take the extreme case where someone has literally no merit. He, he, know, he knows, he inherits some uh, empire. I don't know, like grocery stores or whatever. He knows nothing about it, cares nothing about it, hasn't a clue how to run it and so on. You say, well, clearly you turn it over to the politicians. Well, what's he going to do with that empire? That it will be worth far more to almost anybody else than it would be to him. Now, when things have radically different values to different people, what, all, what, what usually happens in a marketplace is it, it transfers to somebody else. If it's worth $2 billion to him, somebody who knows what he's doing, it may be worth $5 billion to him. And he will pay the five billion to get it, and he will run it better than a politician is going to run it. All right. See, this is the trouble. Taping shows with you, you just talk sense, and you talk it so concisely that we may as well go have lunch right now. <laughs> All right. The argument, the basic argument. Let's lay out the argument here in discrimination and disparities. During the early twentieth century, the key factor behind socioeconomic disparities as seen by leading progressive intellectuals of that era was genetics. In other words, some people got ahead and some people stayed behind mm -hmm. for reasons of race. Yes. The racist argument. By the late 20th century, to continue the quotation, discrimination, insidious, unfair discrimination had become the prevailing explanation. All right, so let's take each of those in turn. The genetic or racist explanation. You write that by the middle of the 20th century, even, in a, even a leading proponent of the influence of genetic factors, such as the famous, infamous, I suppose to many people, Arthur Jensen mm. of the University of California, Berkeley, up the road here, rejected the idea of an IQ ceiling for some groups. Would mm -hmm. you explain what that means? Well, as Jensen said, uh, why are you surprised that there are black children with IQs of 115 and above? That, in the, in the earlier time, in the early 20th century, uh, it was thought that there was a ceiling so low that you had to make sure that certain people simply did not reproduce. That's the whole eugenics movement, right. which was very big. And there were eugenics courses by the hundreds in uh, colleges and universities across the country. Uh, and so Jensen reject, re rejects that kind of rendition of it. Well, once you've rejected that, really, it, it, the rest of it becomes a matter of uh, much smaller consequence. All right. So the, the, the racist argument is rejected on scientific grounds. Yes, r rather than by rhetoric. All right. All right. So uh, this brings us, of course, to the other explanation for disparate outcomes. Uh, once again, at the heart of the prevailing social vision of our times is the seemingly invincible fallacy that group outcomes in human endeavors would tend to be equal or at least comparable or random if there were no biased interventions. Yes. And explain that for us. Well, empirically, it is the easiest way to explain it. Uh, almost nowhere, anywhere in the world or in any period of history, do you find any society in which groups that compete uh, openly end up with the same results. 
uh, as, uh, on, the, on, the, on the genetic side, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's a study of uh, families where someone, one of the kids, becomes a National Merit, Merit Scholarship final, uh, finalist. In five child families, the firstborn becomes the finalist more times than the other four siblings combined. Now, that's not genetic. Uh, there, there are other. There, there actually it's also not discrimination. It's just luck, birth order, the luck of the draw. Well, but it's more, it's more that than that. It tells us something about the importance of parental attention in the development of a child. Uh, and that's also reinforced by the fact that twins tend to ha average several points lower IQ than people born singly. Because Obviously, no, neither twin ever gets the full attention of the, par of the parents. And also, backing that up is that where one of the twin is either stillborn or dies sh shortly after birth, the other twin, ha twin has a, an average IQ much closer to the norm. I see. Okay, so this, what you, the point here is we, we eliminate the argument from racism, mm. which leaves us the argument from discrimination mm -hmm. and what you're saying is no 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 look at example after example after example where we know in more or less controlled experiments yes. families with five kids twins and so forth that there are factors that have nothing to do with justice or injustice mm. but that are simply happenstance is yes. that that's yes. the argument yes also it's true it's also true in four child families three child families two child families oh. it is true in britain and norway and any other all, a number of other countries where there have been huge uh, tests done. All right. So, um, <clears throat> again, I'm going to take discrimination and disparities to bring it to American society. Mm -hmm. It might seem strange, you write, that during the 19th century of mass immigration from Europe to the United States, it was not uncommon to find Jewish and Italian neighborhoods in New York represented by Irish politicians, a situation that did not change until well into the 20th century. How could this have been? Because if you look at the history of the three groups, it's clear that the Irish had a lot more political uh, experience in Europe before, before any of them ever set foot on American soil. I mean, it, it's really, an, when you think of how many factors uh, there are at work, it's incredible to think that they're going to work out the same for, 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 for almost any group uh, uh, defined in any way. Got it. The other thing that's so mm -hmm. frustrating, I, I, can, I can come up with, umpteen different examples of this, this uh, disparities in various situations, including situations where it is not possible for it to be either discrimination or, uh, or, or genetics. People on the other side cannot give you one example. You can read reams of paper by advocates of social justice and not find one example anywhere in the world. There are people who have done international studies Braudel, I quote, the, the French, the French uh, historian. His, historian, he said, in no society has all, all parts of the uh, uh, population had the same outcomes. All right. Um, you note also, by the way, that even within, uh, this I found striking, even within socioeconomic bands or strata, that is people who, or ethnic groups that are actually doing pretty well, uh, there are differences that can be striking. And uh, to quote you again, Jews have been especially well represented in retailing, finance, and garment production, but by no means equally well, well represented in heavy industries su such as the production of steel or automobiles. Yes. And it has nothing to do, not, we're not talking about relative disadvantage here. Mm -hmm. They rose to success in different fields yes. from I don't know. Andrew Carnegie, I guess, is, in, is a Scot who's doing steel, and Ford is the Ford, and the Dodge brothers are, yes. are, are what Northern European stock who yes. handle automobiles, and it just worked out that way. Yes, for no invidious reason. Yes. All right. You see, if you just say yes, well, of course, if I if I just quote the book to you, you're going to say yes, <laughs> <laughs> which is what you should do all the time. <laughs> <laughs> all right. To continue here to lay out your argument. Again, I'm going to quote you, but I'm going to get more than a yes out of you, Tom, on this, this one. Statistical underrepresentation or overrepresentation of various groups is not peculiar to the United States or to our times. For centuries, there have been countries where most members of various professions and most business owners in whole industries have been members of some subordinate minority. All right, you present a couple of examples. Let's take a couple of examples. The overseas Chinese in Southeast Asia. Oh, yes. Tell us about them. Oh, my gosh. The, 
uh, they, they, some people call them the, uh, the Jews of Southeast Asia. Uh, considering the numbers involved, you might call the Jews the Chinese of Eastern Europe. Uh, but uh, there, are, there are country after country where over half of the retail outlets are by, by people who are Chinese. I mean, Malaysia, uh, Indonesia, Thailand, whatnot. There are countries after countries where most of the billionaires are Chinese. Outside China. Out, oh, outside China. And this, one of the other things, too, is this, this ties in, to some extent, with a uh, genetic thing. As of 1994, there were 57 million overseas Chinese and 1 billion people in China. The, over, the 57 million produce as much wealth as the billion people in China. All right. Uh, Jews in Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. as another example of yeah. a subordinate group. Yes. Tell us about them. It's very, very uh, common for, for retailing in many parts of Eastern Europe to be largely in the hands of Jews. Uh, greatly overrepresented in uh, universities. Uh, by the late 19th century, uh, one third the uh, people at the University of Vienna were Jews, and they were usually the more successful students. Right. Indians in East Africa. Oh my gosh. And here, here you see something that ties in with a desire to confiscate the wealth of the wealthy. They did that in Uganda. The people from uh, India and Pakistan uh, dominated uh, uh, modern industry in that, in that country. Eventually, of course, the politicians uh, decided that they, they should be uh, expropriated. They were expropriated. They were sent out, uh, not allowed to take any wealth with them of any significance. And all the stuff that was left there, their businesses and so forth, went, went to the Ugandan. The Ugandan economy collapsed. These people arrived uh, uh, destitute, mostly in England. Uh, and within a, a decade, they were on their way to prosperity again. The same thing with the Cubans uh, here, that when Castro took over. Castro uh, takes over in 1959. A million Cubans leave with almost nothing. Yes. And he left behind all the wealth they had in Cuba. You fast forward a half a century, and the uh, Cuban-American businesses in the United States had a revenue that was larger than the revenue of the entire nation of Cuba. Even though, and, and they weren't, in, in the United States, they weren't driving 1950s cars in the 21st century. All right. All right. So the underlying assumption, just to close up the argument here, the underlying assumption of the social vision, the vision of social justice, that absent discrimination, roughly equal outcomes will prevail, is refuted by every page of recorded history. Yeah. All right. Jews in Eastern Europe, overseas Chinese in Southeast Asia, they rise in spite of discrimination. Yes. All right. Okay. And they rise better than the people who are discriminating against them. All right. Um, we tend to think, I believe, of this new social vision, social justice, as something completely contemporary. But you write that it has been prevalent for half a century. You also argue not merely that it is mistaken, mm. but that it has done positive harm. Yes. Discrimination and disparities. With the prevailing social vision came a more non-judgmental approach to behavior, as well as multiculturalism, a de-emphasis on policing and punishments, and an emphasis on demographically based fair shares for all. So what you're talking about here is not explicitly governmental action or mm -hmm. government programs, but the way people begin thinking about yeah. society. In the United States, you continue murder rates, rates of infection with venereal diseases, and rates of teenage pregnancies were among the social pathologies whose steep Declines in the 1950s reverse and begin to get worse in the 1960s. Yes. Okay. I, ideas alone, it's what people, people carry in their heads. But the ideas were, were, were carried out in policies. Uh -huh. And the classic place were in public housing projects. Uh, people today think of the public housing projects as really uh, just a bedlam and uh, violence and so forth. Drug dens and so forth. Yeah. I remember in the 1940s, one of, one of our relatives was admitted to a public housing project in New York, and we were so proud because back in those days, you got admitted because even though you were just a working person, you had a good record, you, 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 had, a, you had a steady job, uh, women with, uh, with, with, uh, no, with uh, fatherless children were not admitted, and so on. And so it was not just that the, that the place was good, it was that 
it was an honor that he'd passed these tests to get to get into these places. Uh, you tell a tale of two blackouts that, uh. illustra that illustrate what's taking place here. The first blackout takes place in Novem November 1965. I can actually remember that. We lived in upstate New York. I lived in upstate New York. And, and there was a moment that I can remember when we were having dinner and the lights in the house went dark mm -hmm. and then came back up for a moment. We yeah. all looked at each other and thought, what, was, what, what, what just happened there? Well, of course, <laughs> when we turned on the television, we, we found out what happened. Huge power outage yeah. in New York City, whereas upstate, the lights just went down and came back on. In New York City, the, the city went black for yeah. a whole night. Yes. And you write that that night the crime rate was lower yes. than usual, 1965. Second blackout, very similar event, takes place in July 1977, and you write again, New York City was again dark throughout the night, but now there was widespread looting and arson. Yes. 65 people behave themselves in New York City in the dark. Yes. And in 70, so what, what happens in those 12 years? This was, this was one of the many things that turned, uh, tur turned to the worst in the 1960s. There's a whole slew of them. Uh, Steven Pinker has a book about uh, international uh, murder rates. Mm -hmm. And he said the general trend over the centuries is for the murder rate to go down. And, but, in, but in the 1960s, the rate did a U-turn, as he put it. It, it, went, it turned, went right right up. And this was common across Western societies. And it is because of? The same vision out there. And the vision, so I'm trying to, I guess what, one thing I'm trying to get at here is the extent to which, how does it work itself out? Are the cops, because of this new social vision, between 1965, people know that if they, misbe if they try looting or arson, the cops will come right at them? No, no, no. What, 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 so what, how, There's what's only the, so much the, the cops can do. Uh, the first line of defense is morality uh, and the law as a statement of what the principles are. You delegitimize that, and all you've got are the police. Mm -hmm. There aren't that many police. That, uh, you, know, you, you could double the number of policemen. And if you destroy the, 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 the morality, uh, you're not getting anywhere. So in 1965, people who'd grown up, let's see, 65, that's going to be dominated by people who'd been through. The adults in 65 remember the Depression. Yes. They remember the Second World War. Yes. They've had the experience of rebuilding the country yes. in the 1950s. And they take for granted what we would now term traditional morality. Is that yes. correct? Yes. You just don't steal things. Yes. You don't destroy property. Yes. So what? Well, no, another another example. Yeah. There was exchange buffet restaurants that I mentioned. Yes, yes, yes. And I, I actually is, remember is, going to those. And so exchange just, buffet. Just explain what, what's going on. Exchange out here. buffet. You you go in and you pick up. You go through the line and pick up your own food, and then you break your bring your dishes over be there, and then you come to the cashier and you tell the cashier what 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 how, how much you owe. Uh, and there were seventy some of the, the seventy some of these restaurants that are, are, there were a lot of them in New York. Dozens. Dozens. All right. All right. And and, and uh, they lasted for seventy eight years. In the nineteen sixties, they collapsed because people no longer were, were honest. Uh, all right. In England, it was even more dramatic because they really sort of set the standard for self controlled society. And of course, if you have a lot of self-control, you don't need a lot of government control. Right. But if you don't have it, the government is not going to be enough by itself. And the government itself is often uh, tainted, as it were, by, by these same ideas that you... you, you. For, for example, in, in London in 1954, there were a grand total of 12 armed robberies in the city of London that year at a time when anybody could buy a shotgun with no questions asked. Fast forward a couple of decades, and they're at 1,400 armed robberies in London, despite some of the most strict gun control laws in the world. Got it. I'm, so, so I'm, I, I'm, I'm still struck. What do we make about the speed with which society changes? Again, you've got, uh, what I love about the two blackouts is because they're two snaps, they're, they're almost literally, what do people get up to when they think nobody's looking, when yes. the lights go yes. out? And it's just a dozen years between yes. 
good behavior, people helping each other out in this, in this difficult oh, night, yes. and terrible behavior where they're looting and setting fire to property. And how is it that ideas, the wrong I, ideas, can percolate through, can so change behavior in such a brief period of time? Well, it, 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 it it, w it was going, I mean, it was, these ideas weren't invented in the 1960s. Right. But the, but, but the number of people who progressively moved towards uh, those ideas uh, greatly increased. And the whole political and intellectual scene was very different. All right. You spend a good deal of time in discrimination and disparities on the African-American experience in this country. <clears throat> and... In particular, you spend time presenting what might almost be termed a century of hidden history, mm. hidden outside, but displayed in, in this book. I'm going to quote you. The plain fact is that the black poverty rate declined, excuse me, I should say the hidden century from the end of the Civil War mm. to the enactment of the Great Society, yes. which is pretty much an even hundred yeah. years. Yes. And on one measure after another, you argue, African Americans make progress. Yes. Their incomes rise. Educational attainment begins to take off. Family structure remains intact, mm. more intact by some measures than that of white Americans. And now to quote you, the plain fact is that the black poverty rate declined from 87% in 1940 to 47% in 1960, prior to the great expansion of the welfare state that began in the 1960s under the Johnson administration. And as late as 1969, two-thirds of all black children were living with black parents. And then we get the Great Society enacted. Again, I quote you, there was a far more modest decline in poverty rate among blacks after the Johnson administration's massive war on poverty. And by 1995, only one-third of black children were living with both parents, and among black families in poverty, 85% of the children had no father present. Yes. A century of intact African-American families mm -hmm. and economic and educational progress, and then it all goes, begins to slide away. Mm -hmm. Things start to get worse. What happened? Well, the welfare state itself happened, but more than that, it's the welfare state vision the idea that uh, the world owes you something takes off. And it, ha happens, it happened in Britain where the underclass is white. It's amazing, yeah, the, right. the, the, the parallels. And, and similarly, the, the nation, the notion with schools. Uh, in, in Britain, kids in, in, in low-income neighborhoods uh, who want to learn get beaten up by, the, by, by, the, by, their, by their classmates because that's regarded as class treachery. Over there, it's class that's the big deal. Here, it's race. But the re net result is the same. Tom, you had to have been a good student when you were a little kid growing up in Harlem. What, what reaction? Did, do you remember anybody saying, no, 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 don't, 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 be too, don't, be too, don't be too good a student? You'll make everybody else look bad in the family? Or, what, what was it like in your generation when people were beginning to discover that little Tommy Soul was a pretty smart kid? Well, actually, when I first got to Harlem, I, I was not regarded as a pretty smart kid because I'd come out of the South. And back in those days, the Southern uh, education was so inferior to the Northern education that... Uh, oh, you were behind when you were Oh, alive. my gosh. I was... Uh, in North Carolina, I was uh, among the top students in the class. And in, in my first uh, year in New York, I was trailing whoever was the second worst student in the class. <laughs> <laughs> How old were you when you moved from North Carolina up to Harlem? Nine. Nine, okay. So, but somewhere in there, you get a library card and you start reading and, it, oh, and yes. you become a good student. And what is the reaction of your, your family and your neighbors and so forth as you begin to become a good student? Well, I, the neighbors didn't, didn't really know that. Oh, the family, was they, they, they were so pleased. Mm. And I still remember what a to-do they made when I was promoted to the seventh grade. And I wondered why. And someone said to me, you've now gone further than any of us. Wow. Wow. Um, you've just explained we get a century of progress, then a retrogression, as you call yes. it. And the, and the economics was not, was not the reason. I mean, there's no question that blacks in the 1960s had a higher standard of living than blacks in 1940. Right. 
Right, 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 right. So what, how, why is it, I have to say, I, have to, I get to the passages about African-American progress, that century of progress, and I have to reread them because they run so counter to what I believe I understand, mm. which is that the legacy of slavery is so deeply impressed on African Americans, and it's the great society that begins to make some progress. How is it that a whole century of American history is simply gone? It doesn't get talked about. What's well, the explanation it, it, oh, for heavens, that? Oh, heavens, heavens, that, that's not the only thing I, as you know from one of the other chapters there, that the people who talk, look, talk about the 1920s, the history of the 1920s is taught, including in a history book uh, written by a Stanford professor that sells for $160 that I bought recently. <laughs> and, you know, he, tell, he tells you what happened, what Andrew Mellon said and how this was tax cuts for the rich. And uh, all you have to do is pick up Mellon's book and you'll find out what Andrew Mellon said. And all you have to do is go on the internet and get the uh, IRS data of the 1920s. And you find that it bears no resemblance to what is said in this history book that costs $160. Mm -hmm. So ideology trumps historical understanding. Yeah. I mean, I, I, ha I have uh, the IRS data for every year of the 1920s in my file. And it's, it's, it's just farcical. Mm -hmm. And these are not stupid people. And I, I don't believe that all of them are lying. I believe that they've, they've heard what other people have said and they've repeated it and they haven't bothered to check the facts. All right. Um, back to the African-American experience. The biggest internal migration in American history takes place as African-Americans move from the South up to Northern yes. cities. Yes. And there are, it's almost again, a kind of two snapshots. Again, I'm quoting discrimination and disparities. As blacks in northern cities, this is the first arrivals to northern cities, become more acculturated to the norms of the larger society, racial barriers begin to erode. This is in the 19th century. Right. In Illinois, restrictions on access to public accommodations for blacks are removed. In Detroit, blacks had been denied the right to vote in 1850, but they were voting by the 1880s, and then the 1890s, blacks were being elected to statewide offices in Michigan. The 1880s census showed that in Detroit, it was not uncommon for blacks and whites to live next door to each other. Okay, African Americans move north, and all kinds of racial progress takes place. But then, and again I quote you, however, a major, major retrogression set in later in northern cities with the arrival of large masses of black migrants from the South in the early 20th century. So describe that retrogression. What begins to go wrong? Well, in Washington, D.C., for example, uh, blacks had been able to go to various restaurants, uh, theaters, and, and so on uh, prior to the mass migrations that began in the early 20th century. When I first arrived in Washington, blacks could not go to those things in the, in the 19, 1950. So things had gotten worse. Oh, yes, yes. And, and it's not so much the, the, the movement of blacks to the North in, 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 in the 19th centuries. It was blacks who were in the North, which are very small populations. Uh, and they're surrounded by a vastly larger white population. And with other groups in similar situations, uh, you get, you get a, a, um, acculturation by the smaller group to the norms of the larger group over a period of time. And so it wasn't a, a big, big, mig big migrations, but the blacks, for example, at the end of the 19th century in New York, most blacks in New York had been born in New York. By the, at the end of the 19th century? Yes. Right, right, right. And so you, you had a very different population than you had when you have massive numbers of people. All right. You, and you write, neither the era of progress in race relations nor the era of retrogression were simply inexplicable mood swings among whites. The behavior of blacks themselves had changed. Yes. Now explain that. Well, the South is a different culture. And, and, and I, again, to some extent, I was an example of that, that, I, that my education was just not the same as the education of kids who'd been in Harlem all along. So it took me you know, a year or two to catch up. I see, I see. Okay, so, all right. I'm trying to think this through that if the... I mean, for example, yeah. I, I, a story that I've told so many times uh, that, uh, and, that, that my uh, family found a kid, a black kid in Harlem who was 
very uh, uh, well educated and so forth. And they made it a point that he should he should meet me and show me the ropes. And he took me uh, to a public library at the age of nine. I had no idea what a public library was. Uh, and it was only with great uh, reluctance that was I persuaded to take out a library card and borrow a couple of books. But of course, that was a turning point. Got it. Got it. Social justice today. So social justice, the idea of correcting for unequal outcomes, in particular, redistributing wealth from the rich to the poor. So you've already argued, we've already discussed this, that the very notion is ahistorical mm. and misguided, but you argue something more. There is a crucial question as to whether the redistribution of income of wealth can actually be done in any comprehensive and sustainable sense. Close quote. What do you mean? Well, I've used the example before of the we need, uh, Indians. A, we need to send a telegram to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez here. Oh, I, I think it would be a vast waste of money. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I've used the example so far of the, uh, of the Cubans, you know, right. and of the uh, East Asians. But they're all over the place. In the, in the 15th uh, century, in the end of the 15th century, Spain decided to expel all Jews. And as often happens in these cases, they're not allowed to take any wealth with them. And so they, they go to various places, including the Netherlands. Uh, and in, in, over time, they again rise to uh, uh, pr prosperity in the Netherlands, helping to increase the Netherlands economy. The Huguenots in uh, uh, France were uh, being persecuted. They flee to England and Switzerland, uh, and they take their skills with them. Now, prior to that time, France was big. There, there, were, there was no uh, um, watch industry in England prior to the arrival of the Huguenots. So now the, the British could buy their uh, watches from London instead of from France. And moreover, the uh, London watchmakers could compete in the international market with the French watchmakers. And in Switzerland, this is what helped Switzerland to become and remain to this day with the dominant watchmaking country in the world. I and mean, you, you, you can't confiscate source of, 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 the, of their wealth. You can confiscate, and, you, and I did, although I didn't go into it in this book, uh, this is true of, of people who uh, want, want to do this on a local community level. I mean, you know, you, De Detroit was once a prosperous place. They followed policies that drove the prosperous people out. And, the pros and then, of course, they had, they had to leave all their businesses and so forth in Detroit. That was of no use without the people who knew how to operate it. Mm -hmm. Those people, I'm sure, have done much better. Detroit has never fully recovered from that. Mm -hmm. So the idea here is you can, you can confiscate wealth. It's already existing. You can confiscate but it wears material out. goods. Yes, yes, yes. But what point is it? All right. So again, I, I, I'm quoting, going to quote the book once again. Physical wealth is a product of human capital. The knowledge, skills, talents, and other qualities that exist inside the heads of people where it cannot be confiscated, yes. closed quote. So the central question, you're going to correct me if I get this wrong because I have a feeling you're going to slap me around with what I'm about to say. The central question, not just of economic growth, but of social justice mm. is not the distribution of wealth. It's access to human capital. It's access to education is really what it comes down to. Human capital right? goes, yeah, it encompasses education, encompasses but, it not, it. but it's not limited to that. So because it's also the store, so, so where, you have, where you have social pathologies, if it's very hard, I'm just making this up to see how you respond to it. It's very hard, for example, figure that I quoted earlier, where uh, African-American kids living in poverty, 85% of them grow up with only one parent oh, yes. present. That makes it harder for those no, kids no two ways about it. to acquire human capital. So, so access to education, I'm, I'm fumbling here, yeah. access to education, somehow is it, is it the role of government to foster certain kinds of social stability or social skills? Well, you, 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 all, all you can do, you can't give anybody an education. You can then offer them an education. You can show them where the public library is. That, that's right, but that, but that, but that, that's that's it. Okay. Um, all right. And, I, and something else. Uh, I, so social justice is an actual impediment to acquiring human capital, because 
if you're, what it tells you is that the reason you have less is because people have malevolently kept you from, from having the, uh, access to, 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 to all the good things in life. And, that, and if, if that's the case, why in the world should you knock yourself out, learn a whole new culture, develop whole sets of skills and so forth, sacrificed in the present for the future, when it's going to mean nothing? One of, two of the stories I've heard that really pains me greatly, mm -hmm. a couple of young uh, black guys, is it two different guys and two different sets of stories, uh, express a desire to be, become a pilot. And they say, I, I thought about joining the Air Force, but I realized that the white people are not going to let me become a pilot. And they're saying this after there was a whole squadron of black fighter pilots in World War II, and after there have been black generals in the Air Force. But this vision that they're, that, they're, that they're bombarded with tells them that that's not possible, that something that's already happened is not possible. So, so, so the social, the notion that you've been wrong. Yes. Has the effect of, of what, of, of, of encouraging, me, 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 of me. encouraging passivity? No, or well, no, resent, re resentment, resentment, but, but not, but not, but not. The, it, because social mobility is not some easy thing. I don't know if you read uh, the book about the uh, hillbilly elegy. Oh yes, yes, this, yes. Well, J.D. Vance, J.D. Yes. Vance, right? And he, right. he go, but he, what, what a what a trauma it is for him. It was hard to, to to come out of his background and and achieve something in the world. Why in the world would you put yourself through that if you thought that at the end of it all they're going to say no, we're not going to let you fly any of our planes, damn it. Right, right. And also, if so, if you think you've been done, if you think you've been wronged, your recourse might also be more likely to politics to try to, to, try to redress this whole redistribution yes. Oh, yes. rather than hit the books, acquire the skills, get the well, job. And, and, and but the other thing, too, I, one of the, my favorite uh, statistic in there is that uh, the poverty rate among blacks as a whole is 22%. Mm -hmm. Among whites as a whole is 11%. And among black married couples is 7.5%. So, and, so been, and, and black married couples have never had a, a, a poverty rate as high as 10% in any year since 1994. All right. So to the, to the, to the cry, what is to be done? Tom Sowell answers. It's been done. Get an education. Stay mar get married. Have kids after you get married. That's, that's sort of the answer, right? Well, yes. And the things that work for other people work, work, tend, tend to work pretty generally. <laughs> All right. All right. Reparations. Oh. I knew you'd like this one. <laughs> New York Times columnist David Brooks in a column last month entitled The Case for Reparations. Quote, we are at a moment of make or break racial reckoning. We are a nation coming apart at the seams, a nation in which each tribe has its own narrative, and the narratives are generally resentment narratives. The need now is to consolidate all the different narratives and make them reconciliation and possibility narratives. Reparations are a drastic policy and hard to execute. But the very act of talking about and designing them, reparations policies, heals a wound. Oh, it's one of many reasons I don't read David Brooks, but go ahead. Heals a wound and, and opens a new story, close quote. You, you can imagine somebody whose parents, great-grandparents, came here in the 18, 1880s after the Civil War being asked to give reparations to people. Yeah. Uh, even in the even in the antebellum South, most whites did not have slaves. The cost of one male adult slave was more than the average white person earned all year. So they weren't all living in terror with the, with, with their plantations and all the rest right. of it. Uh, it's insane. The other thing I, I have a slight um, sidebar in there on the history of slavery. Mm -hmm. The history of slavery slavery existed all over the world for thousands of years among all sorts of people as far back as the history of the human species goes. It's one of many evils that the left tries to localize when, when in fact it is, a, it is a universal evil. 
So is, is this too strong a statement that it is what is distinctive about the United States is not that it countenanced slavery in the 18th and 19th centuries, but that it has taken such efforts to overcome the legacy of slavery since. Is no, that fair? A, no, uh, that's, that's part of it. But m more than that, uh, as much as slavery is repudiated around the world today, prior to the 18th century, I know of no serious effort to abolish the institution anywhere. 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 Not in Africa, not in, not oh, in the Arabian not world. Not in Africa in the 21st century. Mm. Uh, when Adam Smith wrote in 1776 that the only place in the world where slavery had been abolished completely was Western Europe. Uh, and so this was... As late as, as, late as, the, as late as the year this country was founded. Yes. And so the idea that this is something that the United States had that nobody else had or, or the, the other, other countries that didn't have, uh, it's been estimated that there are more slaves in India than in the entire Western Hemisphere. Mm -hmm. and, that's quite, uh, and that's before and after Columbus uh, got here. Right. Um, last questions, Tom. A statistic. In 2015, this is the most recent year I could find, in 2015, black households at the 20th and 40th percentiles of household income earned an average of 55% as much as white households at those same percentiles, 20th and 40th. Mm. And that figure from 19, I beg your pardon, that figure from 2015 is exactly the same as the figure in 1967. So you can imagine people of goodwill looking at that and saying, only 55% as much as white households, and it hasn't changed since 1967. Dr. Sowell, I grant all of these arguments, but even at that, something must be done. And Tom Sowell replies, how? One way would be to uh, get rid of the welfare state. But also those kind of numbers are very That's misleading. not what they have in mind, I don't think. Perhaps not. Uh, <laughs> One of the problems with those kind of numbers, which I go into in a different chapter on numbers, is that uh, household and family income statistics have a lot of problems with them. And they don't, they don't reflect, for example, uh, in-kind uh, transfers. Right. Uh, and, and the in-kind transfer is not from only... The go from government, welfare payments. Yeah, right, right. that sort of thing. But more than that, the in-kind transfers are among the reasons that people don't have to earn more money. Right. Okay. Once again, discrimination and disparities. The most spectacularly successful political doctrine in the 20th century was Marxism. Yet if the wealth of rich capitalists came from the exploitation of poor workers, then we might expect to find that where there are larger concentrations of rich capitalists, we would find correspondingly larger concentrations of poverty. The facts point in the opposite direction. Explain what you mean by this. Well, the United States has uh, five times as many billionaires as there are in all of the Middle East and Africa put together. And so according to the logic of Marxism, Americans should have a, ordinary Americans should have a lower standard of living than the standard of living of people in the Middle, in the Middle East and Africa. It is just, just the opposite. I mean, Americans on welfare have a higher standard of living than the average person in Africa and the Middle East. So Marxism is simply wrong. Wrong. Demonstrably wrong. Yes. Obviously wrong. Well, obvious to some people. All right. Obvious to you. Uh, now, I, I lured you into a trap. <laughs> a recent YouGov poll found that 19% of millennials, one in five young Americans, holds a favorable view of communism. Yes. Now, let me quote one of these young millennials. A new member of Congress, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who represents the Bronx, not all that far from where you grew up. Quote, to me, capitalism is irredeemable. Close quote. Tom Sowell replies. To me, she's irredeemable. <laughs> oh, right. Oh, but to the, okay, so let's, let's set Al Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to one side. To the one in five young Americans who holds a favorable view of communism, how can this be? What's going on? I think the, the education system has a lot to do with that. Back when I was quite young, 20 years old, 
Uh, I read a book called China Shakes the World about how the communists took over in China. And in the last chapter, he tries to explain it. He says it's, uh, the education system had a lot to do with it. Now, at the time, it struck, struck me as a very odd uh, explanation. Now that I've had a half a century or so in the American education system, it doesn't strike me as odd at all. All right. Tom, would you close by reading a passage from your book, from this uh, new yeah. edition of Discrimination and Disparities? Uh, the last Western nation to end slavery, Brazil, did so in 1888, and the first totalitarian dictatorship arose in Russia in 1917. There was barely a generation between the suppression of one form of monumentally brutal subjugation of human beings and the creation of another. Yet these dehumanizing dictatorships were often founded on stirring rhetoric and lofty visions that resonated with many leading intellectuals in countries around the world. There could hardly be a clearer example of the need for the historic warning, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. Tom Sowell, author of this new edition of Discrimination and Disparities, thank you. Thank you. For Uncommon Knowledge, the Hoover Institution, and Fox Nation, I'm Peter Robinson. Thank you.